We're at the European Heart Journal update and we're at the cardiology update course in Davos and I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Pornikowski. I'm Dr. Bertram Pitt from the University of Michigan and Dr. Pornikowski who has been chair of the ESC guideline committee and uh, there's been a lot of changes since you've developed this and I wonder if you could tell us about some of the highlights because it really has had a big impact your guidelines on clinical practice. So what are the major highlights that we need to know as practicing clinicians? Well, it is quite important. Yes, to entirely agree with you, Bertram. Uh, there were several issues we need to highlight very clearly. Number one, in, in the area of chronic heart failure. Number one is the introduction of a new, I would say not, I would not say entity, but uh, term, heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. The second uh, item I would like to highlight is uh, a new algorithm for the diagnosis of uh, heart failure. Again, not for specialists, but based on the heart failure probability. Number three is a statement, very clear statement about prevention. Uh, in the context of uh, recent developments, uh, at the beginning of the guidelines, we stated very clearly that heart failure is becoming preventable disease, so this is very important. Number four, in the context of chronic heart failure, is a statement uh, in the algorithm. And in, in this algorithm, uh, obviously, we acknowledge the position of uh, sacubitril valsartan and uh, new indications for cardiac resynchronization therapy, and last but not least, comorbidities and multidisciplinary care. So we obviously can't go through all of that but some of the most striking uh, changes are this identification of this mid-range ejection fraction. Uh, but what should we as clinicians do about that? Uh, how do we treat it? How do we uh, think about it? Well, let me first introduce the definition for those who are watching us and maybe are not quite familiar with this heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. We decided to separate heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, in other words, heart failure, and uh, ejection fraction below 40%, 40%. Then we have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where we have a clear uh, ejection fraction 50% and above. We decided to identify this, uh, I, I may use the word gray zone, with ejection fraction between 40 to 50%, in order to initiate uh, interest research uh, on the pathophysiology epidemiology, and finally, as you asked, treatment. For the time being, we virtually don't have, we have nothing in this area regarding treatment. My personal opinion is that uh, taking into consideration the natural history, the pathway, how the patient may get there, it could be either from patients who are heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and recovered, which is uh, quite often now in the era of uh, pharmacological treatment and devices, and in this case, I would follow what we place in the guidelines regarding HFREF, heart failure with reduced. Much more tricky problem is that when we have heart failure patients with ejection fraction of around 47, 48, which resembles, which is quite close to those who are heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So in other words, a little bit different pathway. And in this case, as you know very well, regarding mortality and morbidity, again, we don't have anything. Simply, we don't have any a uh, clear message, including your study, although I believe that uh, we may discuss this later about spironolactone in this group. Great study, congratulations, it's top cat. Uh, however, nothing which we can place in the guidelines. However, we need to treat these patients, and in this case, I would follow two recommendations from the guidelines. First, identify and treat comorbidities, and the second, if there is congestion, use diuretics. So you mentioned the word comorbidities, and the guidelines do uh, explore some of these comorbidities. Tell us what's new in the guidelines about these comorbidities and what should we know? I think three areas, again in the natural. Number one, iron deficiency. And here, as you know, I am, I am very much involved in, with Stefan Anker in these studies. Uh, over the last years, since the previous guidelines were published, so four years, uh, we have uh, now two mid-range, mid mid-size uh, trials. Uh, showing very double blind placebo controls showing very clearly that iron deficiency can be corrected with IV iron uh, not oral IV iron and it improves uh, functional capacity quality of life before you go too far with this tell us how we should diagnose this well that's great 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 question 
again, in the guidelines, there is a very clear statement. Everyone with heart failure should be screened for iron deficiency using very simple parameters, ferritin and transferrin saturation. So I think that's very important information, but I'm not so sure it's happening. So I think this is a very important change that all of us have to learn because we're missing an opportunity. We're missing the opportunity. We have, uh, this uh, assessment is very simple, but I think all of us for a long, long time intuitively linked iron deficiency with anemia. We now too stepped out of this sort of a perhaps wrong paradigm and say iron deficiency may well be present and is present without low hemoglobin level. So what percentage of people without anemia are going to turn up with heart failure and iron deficiency? In chronic, around 35 to 40 percent minimum and in acute setting in the compensation at least 45 percent. So given those numbers we should be screening just about everyone. Indeed, that, that's the recommendation from the guidelines. So you start, I started with iron deficiency, so iron deficiency. Then there is a second uh, entity, diabetes. Uh, we recognize the new study with uh, empagliflozin, very important. I don't have time to elaborate on this, but uh, for the first time we have a clear message from the study uh, with the drug empagliflozin, which improved mortality and morbidity, that this drug can reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization. So a lot of interest around this. And the final comorbidity uh, with a completely new data is central sleep apnea. We recognize the central sleep apnea is affecting patients with heart failure, particularly those with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. And for, for many years, everybody took for granted that we should treat this with this ma mask therapy. However, as you know better as a leader and champion in clinical studies, clinical trials, which actually changed the reality, this time this concept was tested in the SERF-HF trial, and we recognize and we learned that treating these patients with mask therapy, we're actually killing them. So well, that was that particular device. Do, can we apply that to CPAP in general? I think that uh, it may well be, at least we have the evidence for the particular device. We may have uh, some sort of uh, um, concern that uh, it may well be CPAP in general, but now, this is why now we tested a completely different approach to central sleep apnea, which is using a pericardiophrenic nerve, uh, uh, pericardiophrenic vein, and uh, we are stimulating phrenic, uh, phrenic nerve in order to somehow completely change the way how we are treating this, uh, this patient. We will see how the, what, results, uh, what, what the results of the study will show us. But at the end of the day, at this moment, mask therapy with this device is actually forbidden even, okay. class three recommendation. So you mentioned Empareg, and that sort of leads me to prevention because uh, that may be in the long run, one of the most important things, which we haven't done a good job in, is preventing it. Once we get there, we know we have troubles, but if we could prevent it, uh, then that's gonna apply to a much greater population, have much greater impact. So how do the guidelines say we should prevent heart failure? It's a great topic indeed. Uh, as I said, taking into account all the results of the studies published over the last years, we decided to elaborate on this. As I said, we, we made a positive statement for heart failure community, but also for all physicians, nurses, people who are treating our patients, and also for the patients, that heart failure at that time is preventable and treatable. Preventable in the context of a treatment of several comorbidities leading to heart failure, as you, uh, as, you, as you said. So we started by saying, treat arterial hypertension, use statins, but not in patients with heart failure, but in patients with coronary artery disease or at risk uh, of coronary artery disease. Use ACE inhibitors in those if, with asymptomatic LV dysfunction and use beta blockers as well. And finally, in diabetic patients, to prevent hospitalization and death, use empagliflozin. These guidelines are, I think, going to have a great impact, but of course, progress goes on. When can we expect new guidelines? What's going to happen next from the ESC in guidelines? ESC, as you know, has a very rigorous process. Uh, every four years, we should, and, uh, we should expect the new guidelines. So the answer is, in 2020, we would have the new guidelines, but for the time being, we are seeing several studies coming up with a uh, I would say very intriguing data uh, 
which may well be considered uh, as a good excuse, a good reason to propose the update, say 2018, not again to clash with 2020, in order to somehow update what is in the guidelines. As you know very well, we discussed the Danish trial. I, I'm not now expressing my personal opinion, but just uh, naming the trials. There are several trials in acute heart failure and several other small tri smaller trials. So, so we will see uh, and we will sort of weigh the evidence. So given the progress, the new guidelines, I look forward to seeing you in 2019 when we meet again in Davos. And thank you very, thank very you much for uh, being with us today. Thank you.